The question sometimes comes, why is it that in the time of the Buddha people could listen to the Dhamma, gain stream entry after one Dhamma talk? Whereas nowadays you listen to hundreds of Dharma talks and nothing seems to happen. The Buddha addresses the issue. He says if you want to alight on the true Dhamma while listening, you need five qualities. First is that you don't despise the speaker. Second is you don't despise the Dhamma itself that's being taught. In other words, you don't put up any resistance to it. You let it come in. And third, you don't despise yourself. In other words, you don't tell yourself, this Dharma is way beyond me. There's no way I can take it in. There's no way it's really talking about anything going on in my mind right now. As Buddha said, the whole point of the Dharma is that it points. That's what the word desana means. In Pali, the word we use for Dhamma talk actually means pointing to the Dhamma. And it's pointing into your mind, because that's where the real Dhamma lies. The words outside are not the true Dhamma. The true Dhamma is what's developing in your mind. And have some confidence that when the Buddha is talking about the five aggregates, he's talking about things you know. When he talks about the four bases for success, the things you know, these are qualities you have had to at least some extent, and you can build on them now. The fourth quality is that you are single-minded. The word egaka, sometimes it's translated as one-pointed. Ega means one, but aga doesn't necessarily mean point. It can also mean gathering place. So you gather your whole mind around one topic, whatever is being taught, and you don't wander off. And then you practice appropriate attention. That's where you take what you've been listening to and ask yourself, how does this apply to the question of suffering? Is Buddha talking about suffering itself, or is he talking about the cause of suffering or the path? And how does this apply to me? What am I doing right now that is suffering? What am I doing that's causing suffering? What could I be doing? What could I change? So instead of causing suffering, I'm leading away from suffering. So you're focused, but questioning at the same time. The questioning is directed by what you're learning. You have the confidence that what you're learning really is giving you information that you need or that you can benefit from. So as you look inside, you see things you may not have seen before. This is one of the reasons why we listen to the Dhamma. It's like the vocabulary of tasters. Part of their education is not just smelling a lot of smells and tasting a lot of tastes. It's also learning a precise vocabulary to describe them. And as you see that there is such a thing as a precise vocabulary, you begin to notice tastes you didn't taste before, or you tasted them but you didn't notice them. Or with music. We've got a twelve-tone scale here in the West. And it sounds natural to us, and it's as if there were nothing between the tones. But there are other cultures where they have 24 tones in a scale. The tones in, in the cracks between the piano keys. And you would listen to their music for a while, you begin to hear them as distinct tones. In the same way the Buddha is helping you to look at things distinctly inside the mind. To notice skillful events, unskillful events that are happening. And once you notice they're skillful or unskillful, then you know what to do. Something is skillful, you try to develop it. 
If it's unskillful, you try to abandon it. All this comes under appropriate attention. Now, we don't have the Buddha with us now. We can read some of the talks that he gave to other people. We don't know what he would be saying to us. But when you meditate, you want to bring the same five qualities to your own meditation. Because you're listening to the Dharma inside now. It requires the same five qualities in order for you to grow and to benefit from it. You don't despise who's speaking inside. But you do have to train the voices. That's why the Buddha said that the first step of right concentration is includes directed thought and evaluation. It's not like you haven't been doing direct thought and evaluation, suddenly you have to do it. You've been doing it all along. He said that's the basis for all speech. What we're trying to do is direct that in the right direction. Talk about things that are actually helpful. Learn how to evaluate what's going on. Say with the breath. How does the breath feel right now? What kind of breathing would feel best? If you don't know, try things out. Have something you can compare. Try longer breathing for a while, then try shorter breathing. Compare the two. It's through comparisons that you see things. I have a book of photography where the photographer has two pictures for every scene. The larger one, which he said is the better picture, and then a smaller one, which is similar but not quite the same. And explains why he chose the larger one. And looking at the two photos, you really do learn about color, warmth, composition. And you learn lessons you wouldn't have learned otherwise. So it's the same here. Talk to yourself about the breath and try some different ways of breathing. Learn how to observe. This way you train that speaker inside. So it becomes more and more reliable. And you're less likely to trash what observations you've made. And secondly, don't despise the Dharma. The Buddha was very careful to phrase, phrase things well. This is why we say suaka to bhagavadatamo, the Dharma well taught by the Blessed One. He really did teach it well, phrased it rightly, presented it rightly. So take what we've got and apply it to yourself. The Forest Christian, they call that the principle of practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, you don't change the Dharma to suit the time or the place or people's opinions or your own opinion. You're trying to change yourself to be in line with the Dharma. That connects with the next principle. Don't despise yourself. Remind yourself, you can do this. As the Buddha said, if people couldn't practice the Dharma, he wouldn't have taught it. If you couldn't stop doing unskillful actions, thoughts, words, deeds, you couldn't start doing skillful ones in their place, there would have been no purpose in teaching. But, but this is something human beings can do. Think of it, Venerable Ananda's recommendations on conceit. He says, we practice to overcome conceit, but we need to use some conceit in the practice. And the conceit he's recommending is the thought, other people have gained awakening. They can do it. Why can't I? When you have this confidence in yourself, this confidence in the Dhamma, then you give it your full attention. Here as you're meditating, you want to bring that quality of ayaka singleness to bear on what you're doing right now. Because after all, that's the definition of concentration. Jitta sekagata, singleness of mind, singleness of heart. 
singleness of mind in the sense that your focus is right here on one thing. You are the breath. And the breath fills your awareness. That's another way in which it's single. Singleness of heart in which you try to do this as well as you can. You feel inspired by doing this. So you're single-minded and single-hearted and giving yourself to the concentration. Giving your full attention. And then you apply appropriate attention. You start asking the right questions. And the Buddha defines appropriate attention in two different contexts. One it's in terms of mundane right view, or one level of categorical teaching, which is that skillful qualities should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. Another, it's in the, defined in terms of the Four Noble Truths and their duties. You try to comprehend suffering, abandon its cause, realize its cessation. You do that by developing the path. So you bring those questions to the mind. You're just sitting here meditating and the mind settles down. Don't question it too quickly. But once you've really settled down and gotten a sense of really solidly being here, with a real sense of singleness, then you can ask yourself, is there still some disturbance here? In particular, not the disturbances outside. What disturbances come from within the mind? What's causing the disturbance? Can I stop doing it? As you ask those questions, you're on the right track. Notice we're thinking in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Some people define right view as the three characteristics. The Buddha never does that. The three characteristics or the three perceptions have their place within the Four Noble Truths as you apply them to help comprehend suffering or abandon the cause. But the underlying framework you've always got to keep in mind, the framework that actually gives meaning to these perceptions, is the Four Noble Truths. Because on their own, the perceptions just say things are inconstant, stressful, not self. They don't say what you should do with them or how you should react to those perceptions. That's the Four Noble Truths that tell you what you're supposed to do with that. The other day we were talking about emptiness, saying that there are two kinds. There's the emptiness of there's a concentration perception, where you perceive the mind as being less and less disturbed, and you appreciate the emptiness of disturbance. And then the second kind of emptiness. We're seeing that the senses and their objects are empty of self. The question sometimes comes up, which is more basic? And people tend to gravitate toward the second one, emptiness as an attribute of things. But I think the Buddha would have said the other way around. Because again, emptiness, seeing that things are empty, what does that tell you? You could react in lots of ways. But with emptiness as empty of disturbance, it's basically telling you to try to get the mind so there's less and less and less disturbance in there. And one of, these, one of the ways you do that is not applying a sense of self to things. You can see that your sense of self as a disturbance, then you can let it go. So appropriate attention frames things in terms of right view, the Four Noble Truths, telling you what questions to ask, what duties you have to perform. And when you have that quality, as the Buddha said, of all the internal qualities that are conducive to awakening and gaining the Dharma Eye, there's nothing better. As for the external qualities, is that admirable friendship is the number one quality.
So find friends that you admire. Listen to the Dhamma. And take those lessons and internalize them. Meditate in the same way that you would listen to, thoroughly to a Dharma talk, having respect for your, the voices in your mind that are helping you. The Dharma itself, your ability to practice these things. Give it your full attention and apply appropriate attention. Ask the right questions. Carry out the right duties once you've got the answers to those questions. And that's how. Through meditating, you can alight on the true Dhamma. <laughs>